I'm Lynn Packer with OUR Video Op-Ed 23. The Utah County investigation into a suspected satanic child sex abuse ring. One of the suspects is New York Madison Avenue advertising executive Gordon Bowen. Two of Bowen's close friends who are not suspects, Utah Senator Mitt Romney and high-ranking Mormon apostle M. Russell Ballard. Even though Russell Ballard and Mitt Romney are not suspected of involvement in or knowledge of any ritualistic child sex cult, if one existed at all, both have known for more than a decade that Bowen was accused of having bizarre sexual fantasies, of being addicted to pornography, and of alleged sexual assaults. Later in this episode, possible reasons why they looked the other way. It remains puzzling why Russell Ballard and the LDS Church continued to engage Bowen in its public image campaigns. A recent example of the continuing Bowen-Ballard alliance is a multi-million dollar movie about Jesus. Ballard and the Mormon Church entrusted Bowen to oversee the project despite Bowen's weird, even eerie notions about the Savior. The completed film has yet to be released. The project remains clouded in secrecy. A little more detail about the movie near the end of this report. Russell Ballard, who is now second in line to assume the presidency of the LDS Church, is a common denominator between the relatively new child sex abuse investigation in Utah County and the more than two-year-old investigation in Davis County looking into Operation Underground Railroad. Ballard is close to the subjects of both probes. In a previous episode, I already reported that Russell Ballard not only encouraged Tim Ballard to found OUR, but along with two other general authorities of the church, also invested in the Tim Ballard venture. This side note, unlike the late Senator Orrin Hatch and current Senator Mike Lee, Mitt Romney has not publicly endorsed OUR. In fact, Tim Ballard has been talked about as a potential candidate to run against Romney in two years. If a ritualistic child sex ring was operating in Utah, where was Tim Ballard? Was it going on right under his nose? OUR claims it detects and breaks up child sex trafficking rings. It says, it's happening here. Before I proceed, two disclaimers. This report is for mature viewers only. It contains adult themes and sexually explicit content. Also, in 2008, I consulted on a child custody dispute involving Gordon Bowen. When the case settled out of court, I was asked to sign a non-disclosure confidentiality agreement. I declined. That's how sealed records from the case help document this report. The Utah County-based child sex abuse investigation made headlines this summer and fall. Some news outlets called it alleged satanic child sex abuse and a ritualistic sex ring. NBC News reported that the Utah County case is based on a false conspiracy theory, saying satanic panic is making a comeback fueled by QAnon believers and GOP influencers, went on to say baseless accusations are branding people as Satanist pedophiles at the speed of the Internet. These allegations are wild. They are, um, are very unlikely to be true. And um, unfortunately, what happened was that people got them in public records requests and spilled them all over the Internet. And so it's not just enough that something terrible happens. It's that Satan is somehow involved in it. Of more than a dozen names in the victim statements, two have been reported by mainstream media. David Levitt, the Utah County attorney who called a June 1st press conference, revealing that his name appears in witness statements, and David Hamlin, a therapist whose license had been revoked, who was arrested September 30th. More suspect names have yet to be disclosed by major news media. Gordon Bowen is one among many accused of involvement in the alleged child sex trafficking ring. 
His name is in the witness statements document. That testimony was compiled by the Provo City Police Department years ago, before it dropped the case. The report now guides the revived Utah County Sheriff's Office investigation, which picked up where Provo PD left off. Here's one of multiple statements about Bowen's alleged involvement. Gordon made us undress, and he did a huge variety of things to us, including tortured, raped, sodomized, whipped, chained, and urinated on us, and made us do the same things to ourselves and each other. It goes on to say, He is or was extremely wealthy and worked or had worked high up for Coca-Cola. He lived in a huge mansion in the avenues of Salt Lake City. Gordon is a very, very powerful and revered man in the church, if he has retained the position he had 14 years ago. He was the punisher, and we were told he oversaw torture and murder for Master Mahon and the high councils. He would invite us to his mansion in Salt Lake for parties, and, this name was redacted, were always very excited to attend. Sometimes we took the harp and played in a little balcony over one of his main rooms for his guests. Here are a couple of facts about the alleged victim statements. They are largely uncooperated allegations. The child victims have been drugged with peyote, which can cause hallucinations. Thus, some or all alleged crimes could be imaginary, especially alleged murder and cannibalism. What is factual, Bowen did undergo cult-like exorcisms by David Hamlin, the one who was arrested in September, and Bowen was previously accused of sexual assaults. So, who's Gordon Bowen? Let's start with his resume. He's now Chief International Creative Officer for New York City-based advertising agency McGarry Bowen. He was born in 1950, so he's now 72. He graduated from Salt Lake's Highland High in 1968. His future wife was a classmate. He served an LDS mission in England, attended the University of Utah, but did not graduate. In 1974, he was hired as a copywriter for J. Walter Thompson in Chicago. In 1979, he became a creative director for Bonneville Communications in Salt Lake City. That church-owned entity created the world-renowned Homefront series of family-promoting, award-winning public service announcements. That campaign began a few years before Bowen was hired. After leaving Bonneville Communications and Utah behind, Bowen was hired by the prestigious New York Madison Avenue ad agency Ogilvy & Mather. Advertising Age published a cover story on Bowen, headlined, Gordon Bowen, a Mormon pilgrim in the Mecca of advertising. The article included a photo of several former Bonneville Communications employees Bowen persuaded to come along. At Ogilvy, Bowen shot to stardom with the American Express account, coining the tagline, Membership has its privileges. I do have flight 139 leaving in 20 minutes, but only in first class. I'll take it. Okay, they're calling my flight. I'll be there. Much. No, it just started. Where is she? The second potted plant from the left. Coming through when you need it most. Membership has its privileges. In July 1991, the Salt Lake Tribune reported on Bowen's continued ascension and change of ad agencies. The story said, Last week, Mr. Bowen astounded the ad community when he announced he was leaving Ogilvy and the creative direction of its most lucrative account, American Express. He moves to McCann Erickson, one of the world's three largest agencies, to capture the plum of all advertising jobs, chief creative officer for Coca-Cola. In the ad world, getting the Coke account was huge. During that same time frame, Bowen worked on President George Bush's failed 1992 re-election campaign. 
The New York Times reported, The joke on Madison Avenue last week was that President Bush could not nominate anyone to the Supreme Court until Gordon Bowen had made up his mind. During that same election cycle, Bowen assisted in Utah and Richard Iyer's unsuccessful campaign for Utah governor. Iyer losing to Mike Levitt, brother of ritual sex ring suspect David Levitt. In 1994, Bowen worked for Mitt Romney on his Massachusetts Senate campaign. Romney lost to incumbent Senator Ted Kennedy. The next year, another job change. He worked for Young and Rubicam as creative director between 1995 and 97. His biggest account, AT&T. In 1995, he was appointed to the LDS Church Communications Futures Committee. In 1997, Bowen left Young and Rubicam and became creative director for Robert Redford and Sundance. Despite leaving Bonneville Communications, the church's advertising arm, Bowen still advised church leaders. Bowen worked with Russell Ballard and the late Richard Worthlin, a Ronald Reagan strategist and advisor, to rebrand the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints logo so that Jesus Christ appeared in a much larger font. Another example of his work, Bowen produced the award-winning AT&T commercial that seemingly tore a page from the LDS Church's Homefront playbook. The ad shows a working mom getting ready to go to an important meeting when one of her kids asks, when does she get to be the client? The mother relents as a Cindy Lauper hit, Girls Just Want to Have Fun, plays in the background. In the late 1990s, Mitt Romney named Bowen creative director for Salt Lake's 2002 Winter Olympic Games. Bowen conceived the motto, Light the Fire Within, designed the Olympic torch, shaping it like an icicle, and produced the opening ceremonies. Olympic head Mitt Romney would later write, Gordon's talent left us speechless and appreciative. Springboarding off his Olympic Games success, Bowen co-founded his own Madison Avenue ad agency, McGarry Bowen, quickly pulling in big-name clients like Disney, Wall Street Journal, Crayola, Century 21, Staples, Marriott, J.C. Penney. In 2009 and again in 2011, McGarry Bowen was ad ages agency of the year. I'm Rob Lowe. And I'm Gordon Bowen. We no longer have the ability in advertising to have a captured audience. They can zap us away in a nanosecond. And so... By the end of 2019, McGarry Bowen operated in 12 offices in nine countries, with Bowen as its jet-setting ambassador, appearing in television interviews around the world. While Bowen still works out of his New York City headquarters, he also has a home in Salt Lake City, one that gained notoriety in Better Homes and Gardens magazine. The article said, When Gordon Bowen, a global advertising executive with roots in Utah, happened upon the property, it was a far different sight. Gordon is incredibly spontaneous and cinematic, but he was also intent on creating a nurturing home for his two children. On display in one room of Bowen's house, this male nude torso sculpture. As is common with many Greek statues, its junk is fully exposed, which makes a good segue to the next section of this report and Bowen's penis preoccupation. Bowen's erratic behavior includes a penchant for telling penis stories, evil spirit possession paranoia, alleged sexual assaults, and male escort massages. I'll begin this section with one of Gordon Bowen's secretary's recollections. Gordon was a brilliant man, but he also seemed to be tormented by personal demons. He would often sit in his office alone in semi-darkness, jotting down his thoughts on a yellow notepad. Sometimes I would see the cryptic scribblings, things like, it's not good for a man to be alone, take advantage of New York opportunities, Repair relationship with Dad. I have sinned greatly against God. He also seemed to have difficulty managing his finances. He must have been making an enormous amount of money, 
But bills were never paid on time, and creditors would call often demanding payment and threatening litigation. One day he gave me an envelope bulging with cash and sent me by taxi to a bank to make a credit card payment, which was overdue. In connection with Bowen's divorce and custody dispute, a former FBI agent gathered almost a dozen sworn statements from former Bowen co-workers. Here are some excerpts. He said he had been raped and sodomized by a man who was a friend of his father while his father looked on. I went to Gordon's house for one night only. Gordon showed me sheets that had been cut and clothing that had been torn. He told me that evil spirits had done these things. Gordon claimed to be beset with evil spirits nibbling on his body. Gordon would call me and ask me to stop by his house and stay with him because of his fear of evil spirits. Once I went to his house and found him looking exhausted and sitting in a corner on the floor. He told me he had been choked by an unseen evil presence. I recall that Gordon was an endless pattern of deception and deceit. While at Bonneville, Gordon would make a point to talk about how other people had said how Christ-like he was. I observed Gordon had delusions of grandeur. It seemed he felt he had some grand mission to accomplish in the church, but at the same time it was obvious he wasn't active. More often than not, he did not go to church on Sundays. Gordon wore his membership in the Mormon church on his sleeve. His wicked ways have scarred forever the reputation of the church in the New York advertising community. Gordon's homosexual, sadomasochistic activities became an embarrassing, widespread joke in the advertising community. In about 1987, when Bowen lived in a suburb in Westchester County, neighborhood boys had broken into his home and smeared feces on the walls and furniture. A friend said it appeared Gordon had been involved with the youths and that they were none too happy about it. In about 1992, Bowen did not show up to a meeting. Soon thereafter, there were rumors that Bowen was found naked, chained or handcuffed to a bed or radiator, feces smeared on his body. Gordon told me that he had burned his dick while he was ironing. He explained that he was naked while ironing and that the iron hit his penis. Gordon liked to tell various stories involving a penis. He repeatedly told about being in the bathtub and having his penis rise to the surface and about his cat attacking his penis. I heard him tell this several times. At one time, Bowen aspired to be a Hollywood screenwriter. That may have been the motivation behind two of his literary writings titled Dearest Savior and The Holy Dream. In 1992, Bowen began drafting a story, maybe a screenplay, that he titled Dearest Savior. He dedicated it to Barbara Timothy, who he had yet to marry, and to Jesus. Here are two excerpts. Open with a child, long blonde hair, blue eyes. She is in prison. As far as I can see are thousands of adult men, naked, all have extremely small penises, but they're fixated on them. In fact, all are doing exercises of some kind or another, trying to make them larger. I take the child in my arms. All the naked men are in the fiery furnaces doing their penis exercises. I hold her next to my chest and escape. During a 2008 video deposition, Bowen admitted it was his handwriting, but claimed he could not remember writing it. Gordon's dearest savior script for Barbara and Jesus, my only true love. It's in 1992. There it is. Open with a child, long blonde hair, blue eyes. She is in prison. As far as I can see, are thousands of adult men naked. All have extremely small penises, but they are fixated on them. In fact, all are doing exercises of some kind or another to make them larger. Do you remember that, writing that? I don't. Is that not your writing? Yes, it is. A couple more quotes from Bowen's script. I am holding the child. She is sentenced to death for killing a man. The man, who is the largest, looks surprisingly like my father. 
doing penis exercises feverishly. The man she killed was killing children and sexually abusing them. She says she was not sleeping with the man, although some accuse her of it. The second story, Bowen titled The Holy Dream. He was also asked about it during his deposition. It's a story about Jesus riding a horse. There's a scripture in the Old Testament about Jesus riding a white horse, but Bowen's story has him riding a black horse. Here's the storyline. A voice tells a boy child he needs to cross a treacherous ravine to find hidden treasure, gold, on the other side. In the ravine below, he sees a river of blood with millions of heads bobbing to the surface, disemboweled, disembodied, but very much alive. The voice says, you must cross the ravine now. Make the leap of faith. Jesus will carry you. Just come to me, Jesus, right on my back. We will cross the chasm together. The story describes a juicy, naked, engorged Jesus mounting a black horse, wrapping his bare thighs around the hairy mane. It seems the Bowen story infers at times he's the horse that Jesus mounted. The horse says or thinks, I'm ready for this eternal rider. Rub me. Mount me. Then he writes, and this is copied from the script, Children run forward. There are hundreds of them. But a few, a chosen few, come forward with outstretched arms and begin to stroke me, touch all my hidden places, the tingling tenderness. I feel overwhelmed with awe. Awe. Bowen's phone records obtained during his custody dispute show he frequently hired male escorts in various cities to give him massages. One example, this is a Salt Lake Escorts website with a link to nude photos. Another in Nevada, I blacked out the Escorts erection. Bowen denied sex with male prostitutes, but he admitted being fondled by male masseurs. This Q&A is from a video deposition. Did you ever request the services of male prostitutes? I have never had a sexual relationship with another man, prostitute or otherwise, but I did have massage services from males that I hired to do so. And do male massage services that you used also massage the genital area? They can, yes. Did they, in your experience? Uh, a couple of times. I didn't like it, so I stopped it. Did you ever request the services of male prostitutes? Um, the, um, I have never had a sexual relationship with another man, prostitute, or otherwise, if that's the question. Um, but I did um, have massage services from... Um, males that I hired to do so, yes. And do male massage services that you used also massage the genital area? Um, the, uh, they can, yes. Did they in your experience? Um, a, a couple of times I didn't like it, so I stopped it. Reasons for employees quitting or being fired are often confidential but former Bowen colleagues believe he was fired from several jobs. From Bonneville Productions, the rumor was he was padding expenses or odd behavior or a lawsuit threat. Ogilvy and Mather. McCann Erickson, rumors of the botched Coca-Cola account or the found tied to a bed incident. Young and Rubicam, rumored expense padding and from Sundance, expense padding, and maybe watching porn and putting it on his expense account. Bone, however, has been like this cat escaping a burning building. He gets out of what looks like a career-ending screw-up and lands on his feet time and time again. Bowen believed he had a special mission to perform for the Mormon church. 
But the conflict is, he's gay, and the LDS Church teaches gay sex is a sin. For religious and business reasons, Bowen created an appearance he's straight. He dated women from time to time to bolster that appearance. He believed God chose Barbara Timothy to be his wife, even before she was widowed with three children. In 1995, Bowen, at age 43, married Barbara Timothy after her first husband died. It was his first marriage. Barbara Timothy's husband, Stephen, a veterinarian, died at age 40. Barbara and Steve had three sons. Gordon Bowen, even before Steve's death, had targeted Barbara as his wife-to-be and attended Steve's funeral. Three months after Stephen's death, Bowen wrote Barbara, referring to Warding in the LDS Temple ceremony, and warned that Satan taught that God was without body parts and passions. Then, skipping ahead, Bowen wrote, God the Father has a penis, and God the Mother has a vagina. During the courtship, Bowen arranged for LDS Apostle M. Russell Ballard to give Barbara a priesthood blessing. Marriage would bring Bowen in line with the LDS position that marriage between man and woman is essential to his eternal plan. At this time, Bowen was consulting with top church leaders, including President Gordon Hinckley, about branding and image matters. Apparently, they didn't like the fact a top advisor was still single, so leaned on Bowen to get married, as reflected in Bowen's letter to President Hinckley, which said, The last time I spoke with you via Elder Ballard, your words were, Tell him to get married. Now, Bowen asked President Hinckley to officiate at his upcoming temple marriage to Barbara. The couple was married on September 23, 1995, in the Salt Lake Temple, but it was James Faust, a counselor in the First Presidency, who officiated, not Church President Gordon Hinckley. Faust, who married Gordon and Barbara, seen here later with the couple's first child, had taken a strong stand against homosexuality. He taught homosexuality is not acquired by birth, it's by choice, and is pleasing to the devil. He said the false belief in inborn homosexual orientation denies to repentant souls the opportunity to change. Why didn't President Hinckley marry Gordon and Barbara? At the last minute, Hinckley decided to announce the long-anticipated proclamation to the world about the importance of heterosexual marriage in opposition to gay marriage. We have felt to warn and forewarn. In furtherance of this, we of the First Presidency and the Council of the Twelve Apostles now issue a proclamation to the Church and to the world that marriage between a man and a woman, woman is ordained of God. We further declare that God has commanded that the sacred powers of procreation are to be employed only between man and woman lawfully wedded as husband and wife. We warn that the, that the disintegration of the family will bring upon individuals, communities, and nations Calam the calamities foretold by ancient and modern prophets. The proclamation underpinned LDS opposition to gay marriage, including the Church's successful 2008 campaign in California supporting Proposition 8, a ban on same-sex marriage. President Hinckley, having made the proclamation to the world earlier in the day, made it to Gordon and Barbara's lavish wedding reception, as did Massachusetts millionaire Mitt Romney, among other celebrity guests. Gordon and Barbara had two children. 
Gordon went through several job changes, firings, major advertising successes, as already noted. He was excommunicated from the LDS Church in January 2003. The reasons were not made public. Barbara was told Russell Ballard knew about it. Gordon's lie about being gay, his extreme erratic behavior, worry about possible pedophilia were among factors that led to divorce. Bowen's journal shows that he thought he could help his church with the so-called gay problem. Among entries, get rebaptized. You need to help the church know how to cure homosexuality. You need to be in touch with President Faust. Send Mel's book to President Faust. Here he's referring to Mormon exorcist Mel Fish. There is much yet to know to exorcise and exercise. You've been targeted by Satan himself. Barbara has been possessed by evil spirits just as you were and are. Barbara is controlled by evil spirits right now, but you gave them to her through intercourse. The female evil spirits that are holding onto your core must go to the light. Plan the attack. This is Pearl Harbor. Pay. You have got to go in blazing on a white stallion. Get prepared for war with Satan. He's trying to destroy you and your family. Barbara is his instrument now. You need to look pure in your eyes to your family and friends and bishop. You need balls. Make certain that you do not eat refined sugar. It feeds your negative energy and a false female in you. It saps you of your masculine strength. Bowen attempted to convert himself from gay to straight during the marriage. He believed his homosexuality was caused by evil spirits or female spirits that inhabited his body. He sought to have those spirits cast out by self-proclaimed exorcists David Hamblin, Melvin Fish, and Kissy Watkins. Hamblin is the one arrested this past September. Fish and Watkins are deceased. Hamblin divorced in 2003. During the trial, he was accused of experimenting with his children using peyote and hypnotism. Two of four daughters testified he sexually abused them. Trial judge Stephen Hansen found that during the period between 1991 and 1999, petitioner taught each of his minor children and respondent, that's his wife, about his parts theories and used his minor children as guinea pigs or experiments by conducting psychological therapy with his minor children, including, among other things, the use of hypnosis and giving them priesthood blessings. Petitioner gave each of them, including, and I've redacted out the daughter's name, peyote, on at least one occasion. One daughter became violently ill as a result of using peyote, and another became dizzy and hallucinated. Kissy Watkins attended BYU and the University of Utah. She was a return Mormon missionary. She worked with David Hamblin. She engaged in quackery practicing Christ-centered healing and cranial osteopathy and foot zoning. Dr. Melvin Fish wrote the book Healing the Inner Self. I interviewed him prior to his passing. He told me, Gordon told me he was gay and needed help. Fish performed a kinesiology test and found Bowen possessed by two or three malicious female spirits who made Bowen 90% gay. Fish exercised the spirits, changing Bowen to 10% gay, which he considered normal. Bowen talked about the exorcism in his journal with God speaking to him. You have rid yourself of 90% of your age parts. However, what remains is strong and female and robs you of power and voice. Trust me, believe, faithful, 
Fill your body with faith. Mel is right. You are not an H man, referring to homosexual. This is Satan's lie. Another entry where God speaks to him. Gordon, my son, believe what happened with Mel and with Kissy. It's true. You did cast out female spirits from your body that are not you. You are not an H-man, period. One of Barbara's sons, by her first marriage, provided an affidavit about David Hamblin. David Hamblin arrived to stay in Gordon's New York apartment who had been Gordon's therapist years ago. Having had his license revoked and his specialty now was casting out evil spirits. They sat us down and essentially told us that our mom was off her rocker, that if she did leave Gordon, she would be making a serious mistake and that God would be very angry with her. Next, Mitt Romney and Gordon Bowen. One website has already named Bowen as an alleged perpetrator in the Utah County case and connected him to Mitt Romney. The headline, High-Profile Individuals Involved in Child Ritualistic and Sexual Abuse Throughout Utah. It says, Gordon Bowen has the most disturbing allegations against him. He is a high-ranking member of the Church of Satan. Then it says Olympics, Bowen also helped campaign for Mitt Romney when he ran for office. Craig Romney also works or worked for Bowen at his company, McGarry Bowen. Well, it's not yet established as fact there ever was any Church of Satan, but as reported, Bowen did work for Romney campaigns and on the Olympics. Here are some bullet points. In 1993, Bowen worked on the unsuccessful Mitt Romney for Senate campaign in Massachusetts. In 99, he helped Romney with the 2002 Winter Games. In 2002, Bowen advised Romney on his successful campaign for Michigan governor. Then in 2007, Bowen advised Romney as he campaigned for president and Mormon leader Russell Ballard as he traveled the United States defending Mormonism, ostensibly to help the Romney campaign. Bowen was also connected with Mitt Romney's sons. Bowen befriended four of five sons, Tag, Josh, Ben, and Craig. A family acquaintance says the boys often used Bowen's apartment as a crash pad when visiting the Big Apple. Two sons, Craig and Ben, lived with Bowen when they interned at his ad agencies. Tag steered a lucrative Reebok contract to Bowen's business, and Bowen helped Josh with a short career stint as a model. In 1996, Bowen arranged an internship at his New York ad agency for Ben Romney, Mitt's second youngest son. He reportedly stayed with Bowen at his apartment. He's now a radiologist, lives in Holiday, Utah, with his wife and child. He declined an interview. Bowen introduced Josh to modeling when Bowen was at Sundance. He arranged a catalog shoot in Santa Barbara. Here's one of the shots. A friend said Josh quit modeling after that. The friend said... I think a lot of families in the Mormon culture are kind of wigged out by the whole idea that you can be a model, like every day is gay, that it's an immoral business. He said, I felt like there was some pushback for Josh. Youngest son Craig did a two-month internship at McGarry Bowen before graduating from BYU in 2005. During the internship, he stayed with Bowen at his Chelsea apartment. I interviewed Craig, who told me he knew Bowen as gay, mostly based on his mannerisms. Next in this report, Ballard's and Bowen's secret Jesus movie. It's an example of the continuing alliance between the men. It was a multi-million dollar project Ballard and the Mormon Church entrusted to Bowen, despite Bowen's odd, even eerie notions about the Savior. Details about the Jesus movie have been kept secret. Neither Ballard nor Bowen will comment. 
What little is known in about 2019, the LDS Church, likely via Russell Ballard and the Public Affairs Committee, wanted to commission a Hollywood-style feature film about Jesus Christ. Ballard directed the project to his longtime friend and media advisor, Gordon Bowen, rather than to the church's in-house Bonneville Communications. The movie project, ostensibly costing $20 million, was never publicly announced, and details about when and where it was filmed kept secret. As the project began, a member of the church who knew Gordon Bowen wrote Russell Ballard, describing Bowen's unsavory reputation. I had to tell Ballard this guy is really bad, the writer said. The letter asked, What if it comes to the attention of the national press? This man has so much influence with LDS leaders, and he's a child molester. It would be terrible for the church. The member got a phone response from Ballard's secretary saying, We're keeping an eye on him. The project proceeded under Bowen's direction, and at least a rough cut of the movie was produced. After the film was shot and edited, Bowen apparently previewed it in his Salt Lake home for some Mormon general authorities. One source outside church leadership circles who saw the film said it was a disaster. The footage was said to have been turned over to the church's in-house division for film production, Bonneville Communications, to see if they could salvage it. Apparently not. No Mormon Jesus movie has yet been announced. Bowen Ballard and Church Media Relations will not comment. Finally, wrapping up this report, did a satanic child sex abuse ring operate in four Utah counties? Were David Levitt, Gordon Bowen, and others named by alleged child sex abuse victims participants in a sex-crazed, devil-worshipping cult? Or falsely accused? Looking at the satanic allegation by itself, nothing publicly known corroborates the victim's satanic claims. While there's not enough known to rule out devil worship, based on what I know, it's very unlikely. Bowen wanted evil spirits cast out, not summoned. His writings castigate Satan and venerate Jesus. There is not yet any physical evidence of devil worship. However, as near as I can tell, the case was never fully investigated by Provo Police and later Homeland Security before they both dropped it. Experts have found most claims of satanic child sex abuse to be false. The FBI's ritual child abuse expert, Kenneth Lanning, submitted a report in 1992. He wrote, In 1984, when I first began to hear stories of what sounded like satanic or occult activity in connection with allegations of ritual sexual victimization of children, I tended to believe them. But after years of investigating, Lanning concluded almost all allegations of satanic child sex abuse are false. He did say, I believe the majority of victims alleging ritual abuse are in fact victims of some form of abuse or trauma. He added, I'm concerned about the credibility of the child sexual abuse issue an outrage that in some cases individuals are getting away with molesting children because we cannot prove they are satanic devil worshipers. In 1992, the Utah Governor's Office funded a quarter million dollars for an attorney general investigation into Utah ritual abuse. The task force's report was published in 1995. It said, the AG's office studied 300 cases of ritual sexual abuse which claimed children were sexually abused and Satanism was involved. We were only able to truly get confessions where someone had used Satanism or Satanic beliefs or doctrine as part of their control mechanism in only about three or four. Allegations of organized Satanists, even groups of Satanists who have permeated every level of government and religion, were unsubstantiated. 
Mike King, who led the investigation, concluded, however, it is possible and even likely that there were isolated instances of child sex abusers using satanic or occult imagery to scare victims into silence. Even though very few, there have been Mormon-related ritualistic cult-like child sex abuse cases. One was the 1991 Zion Society cult case. It was a deviant polygamous cult, or ring. There could have been up to 4,000 child victims. Twelve were eventually convicted. Deceived is a book about Detective Mike King's investigation and ultimate takedown of the deviant polygamous cult led by Arvin Shreve. Another is the case of Ann A. Johnson Davis, where there was concrete evidence of satanic ritual child sexual abuse. It was not prosecuted because of the statute of limitations. Davis, now deceased, wrote a book about her ordeal. That's the end. Viewers who wish can email comments or suggested corrections to lpacker636 at gmail.com.